So, um, in my lecture today, I would uh, like to present the conception of melancholy treated by the two philosophers, Montaigne and Descartes, who both had a great medical knowledge inspired mainly by Galen's theory of humors. The case of Montaigne is very interesting, as the philosopher seems to have a predilection for melancholy, suffering from a chronic illness that affected him regularly. Even though uh, he claimed to be free of this humoral disorder, with many passages in his essays speaking of melancholy, sadness, or even thoughts about death and the loss of a loved one. Furthermore, we have this curious trip to Switzerland, where Montaigne consulted a doctor and afterwards revised some passages on melancholy in his own text. Dika too is led to reflect on this illness, which was fashionable in the 60s and 70th centuries, to his correspondence with Elizabeth of Bohemia, who regularly suffered from her weak body and was affected by a slow fever. Melancholy and fever are two diseases commonly associated with a humoral disorder in which the lower abdomen or mesentery seem to play an important role. So let us start with some general um, definitions about mesentery, fever and melancholy before coming to Montaigne and his trip to Basel. This trip to Basel brought him into contact with Felix Platter, who had a new theory of melancholy. Finally, we will focus on some ideas from Descartes concerning fever and melancholy. So let us start with some general definitions. Um, anatomically, the mesentery is part of the digestive system. It is a fold of the lining of the abdominal cavity, which attaches the intestine to the abdominal wall. And here you can see it in red. One of the first description of the mesentery dates back to Leonardo da Vinci. Until now, the mesentery was thought to be a kind of appendix of no medical interest. However, recent studies by Irish doctors show that it should be considered an organ of the digestive system. This so-called new organ already described by da Vinci in one of his texts on human anatomy dating back to the 16th century, connects the intestine to the abdominal wall, allowing it to remain in position. Apparently, da Vinci did not base his work solely on his own observations, but also on traditional medical treatises that considered the mesentery to be an important part of the digestive system. And we will see that it is precisely as a key element of the digestive system that it will play a major role in the understanding of melancholy, especially in the work of the Swiss doctor Felix Platter. For a more general definition of fever and afterwards uh, for melancholy, we will refer to Professor Dr. Michel Stolberg's book, Learned Physicians and Everyday Medical Practice in the Renaissance, published by De Greuter in 2022, because his book refers to the medical understanding of the 16th century and is one of the most recent books on this subject. Under his uh, chapter, Diseases, the first one listed is fevers in plural. And Stolberg writes, and I'm quoting him, as is suggested by the plural forms that were commonly used at the time, such as variae febres, fever in Latin febris, meant more than an elevated body temperature as we understand it today. A fever was not a symptom, but a disease. More precisely, it was the umbrella term for a series of different diseases with different symptoms and or causes, end of quotation. In this sense, an active body heat, what today we call fever, is not the only symptom of fevers. Even coldness could be a symptom. And fevers have different causes and different symptoms. Generally, one distinguished between three types of fevers. Febris ephemera, febris hectica, and febris humoralis. It is especially this third type of fever that interests us today. The febris humoralis, or putridae, and I quote, were caused by morbid matter and arose when humors in the body decayed, spoiled or rotted. Hot yellow bill and moist phlegm in particular tended to do so and sometimes both spoiled together, end of quotation. This was mostly due to stagnancy or obstruction. And I quote again, Professor Stolberg, if the natural flow of the humors was impeded, the humors would spoil on what? End of quotation. The same link between humors and diseases is found in the understanding of melancholy. 
And here again, I, uh, I quote from the Learned Physicians book, uh, one Professor Stolbergs White writes, um, melancholy as has received much attention in studies in the history of the Renaissance, including literary scholars and art historians. Derived from the Greek words for black and bill, melancholia first of all denoted one of the body's four natural humors, black bill. It was described as cold and dry and having a tough consistency. Its primary seed in the body was the spleen, whose size, according to Fallopia, varied depending on the amount of black bill that had accumulated in it. End of quotation. There is a lot in this passage that should arouse our interest. First of all, melancholy is named by Professor Stolberg together with madness in the title of the chapter. And we will see that this was a common association in the Renaissance. The line between madness and melancholy was considered very narrow and a melancholic person always had to fear going mad. Montaigne in particular will take up this motif in his essays. Furthermore, in melancholy, Black Bill is the humor that plays the major role in this disorder, who has its seat in the spleen. The ancient belief that held sway until the 20th century was that health and disease are based on a balance or imbalance between the four bodily fluids or humors, and that excess black bill was responsible for depressive symptoms. In addition, melancholy was a common ailment in the 16th and 17th century, so much so that the English writer Robert Burton devoted an entire book to it, entitled Anatomy of Melancholy, in which he quoted passages from Montaigne's essays. In his book, Burton distinguishes between two types of melancholy, one that is a disposition and the other that is a permanent state. Transient melancholy is accompanied by sadness, fear, grief, anguish, and other such patients. It can affect anyone, according to Burton, even the wisest and most well-adjust person, and is opposed to happiness and joy. Although melancholy is very often only temporary state and joyful thoughts can dispel it, there is a danger of thinking too long into these periods of fear and sadness to the point where a man becomes completely melancholic. Then melancholy is seen as a sickly state, just like a depression. So if the main seed of melancholy is the spleen, why did I then mention the mesentery and not the spleen in the title of my uh, talk? And what explains this shift from the spleen to the mesentery in medical theories, so that one sees elements of it in Montaigne's philosophical approach? So let us come to Montaigne and his uh, trip to Basel. In September 1580, Montaigne spent a few days in Basel during his journey to Switzerland, where he met Felix Platter, a physician and anatomist. And here you can see Felix Platter. After studying medicine in Montpellier, Felix Platter returned to Basel in 1557 at the age of 21 to set up a medical practice. After initial financial difficulties, he gained a reputation as a physician who brought him e patients even from abroad. Later, he was appointed chief physician and pharmacist of the city of Basel and even dean of the medical faculty and rector of the university. Had Morantin made an appointment with this doctor, who was also known beyond the Swiss borders and therefore known in France? And if this is so, why does Montaigne travel to Switzerland to consult the doctor? What we know today is that this meeting was not simply a visit to the city of Basel, but that it was also oriented towards an exchange of religious or even philosophical ideas on the one hand, which took place during the supper with Plata and Ottoman, and medical and anatomical ideas on the other hand. Thanks to Platter, Montaigne, for example, was able to see the skeleton reconstructed by Vesalius, which was exhibited at the University of Basel, and the skeleton reconstructed by Platter himself in 1571, which was in his own house. There, Montaigne could also admire Platter's innovation of no longer simply drawing the herbs, leaves, and flowers, but gluing them into the herbarium in such a natural way that the individual leaves and fibers could still be seen. 
In addition to all this, Montaigne witnessed the operation on an umbilical hernia of a child about whom he was writing and quote uh, from the journal or, or the, the diary of travel from Montaigne. I quote, we saw a small child of a poor man being cut for the rupture, which was very roughly cut by the surgeon, end of quotation. So all these little indications, this organized meeting with the doctor and exchanges on medicine anatomy lead us to believe that Montaigne who throughout this journey tried various treatments for his stone disease, wanted to consult this great doctor for his gravel. In addition, we know that Felix Platter himself suffered from urinary problems as a child and made them a subject of medical interest, even publishing remarks on mixtion and painful mixtion in 1614. So if Montaigne really consulted Platter because of his illness, then it is quite possible that the two men must have exchanged views on Montaigne's general condition, on his character traits, and on the treatment already tried. Because doctors, as write Montaigne, needs all the circumstances, conditions, and pieces to make the right diagnosis. In what state of health was Montaigne when he visited Platter, and what symptoms did he describe to him? And I will show you the quotation from uh, the essays. I have the worst disease of all, the most sudden, the most painful, the most deadly and the most irreversible, wrote Montaigne around 1579, after he had been suffering from, uh, for 18 months from the stone disease, which caused him severe colic and pain, and from which he knew the inevitable outcome that, is, that his father had experienced, namely death. These pains, which accompanied him for the rest of his life, are also described in the travel diary from 1580 onwards, where Montaigne embarked on a kind of therapeutic journey, trying out different waters and baths. His secretary gives a very precise account of the pain and suffering of the philosopher. And here we read the quotation. On the sixth day, he had a very vehement colic and more than his own, he had it on his right side. This lasted four hours and during the operation, he evidently felt the flow of the stone to his uretra and lower abdomen, end of quotation. That the secretary is so well informed about the suffering and the number of kidney stones rendered by Montaigne may be surprising. However, Montaigne never wanted to hide his illness since it was part of his life and above all his being. Since health as well as illness are part of one's being, it is not surprising that Montaigne's essay are also full of anecdotes and reflection on his nature, character and health. Throughout the essays, Montaigne proves on numerous occasions his good knowledge of medical theories and above all the theory of humors, which he probably studied, at, um, studied to understand his own body and conditions. Already in the first edition, which we call today the state A of the text, and we have three states of the essays, so three correction states. But in the first edition, what, what were, which was written before 1580, Montaigne refers to the natural humors, the sinful humors, which he calls humeur pecante and melancholy, but also, uh, uh, always only as a mood or a trait of character. Of himself, however, he writes, and I quote him again, I am in my own nature, not melancholic, but meditative. And there is nothing I have more continually entertained myself with all than imaginations of death, even in the most wanton time of my age, end of quotation. Montaigne claims not to be melancholic, but he confirms that he directs many of his thoughts towards sad or melancholic subjects, such as death and illness. Even in the 1580 edition, Montaigne openly distances himself from melancholy. It is above all because it had become a fashionable condition during the Renaissance and the borderline between genius and madness in melancholy was very minimal in this state. We have an, uh, uh, a book from Michel Scratch on Montaigne and melancholy where he writes, uh, Scratch uh, writes, I quote him, in late medieval and Renaissance France, sadness was an aristocratic emotion, a sign of sensitivity and depth of mind. This delicate and precious sadness gradually melded into a more interested, interesting state, melancholy, which many nobles affected in reality or in literature, end of quotation. 
But Montaigne was by no means satisfied with this fashion, which valued humor's uh, eccentricity. For him, as for Horace, sadness, if not melancholy, always retained the etymological meaning that is linked to malignity or morbidezza in Italian. He therefore tries to distance himself from it by using other terms, such as meditative, or by rejecting completely the, uh, the idea, like in this quotation. I, for my part, am very little subject to these violent patients. I am naturally of a stubborn apprehension, which also by reasoning I every day harden and fortify." End of quotation. However, Montaigne, with his self-analysis in the essays, cannot entirely deny melancholy, even if at first he considers it only as a character trait or as a passing mood. He understands that his, that his moods are vacillating, that they are unstable and go hand in hand with his general state of mind. All these internal agitations do not follow a logical order, but erupt as he goes along. For Montaigne, they are par therefore part of his very being, his life and his condition, which are continually vacillating. That is why he has to admit that it was melancholy that drove him to write the essays. And I quote him, it is a melancholic humor and consequently a humor very much an enemy to my natural complexion engendered by the pensiveness of solitude into which for some years past I have retired myself that first put into my head this idle fancy of writing." End of quotation. So Montaigne's meditative state was reinforced by the loss of La Boissy, his best friend, and by the deep mourning that Montaigne experienced. He said that he is losing a part of himself when he lost uh, La Boissy. It was this continuous sadness that led Montaigne to put his thoughts and opinions on paper and so to write the essays. Thus, the philosopher could not rid himself of melancholy and had to accept it that it, uh, that it accompanied him in his life. However, still fearing that he would be described as ill or mad, Montaigne adds in the second edition, that is in the state B of the, of the essays, that this melancholy which affects him at times goes hand in hand with his jovial state as the other side of the coin. It is important for him to specify that this melancholic trait is a simple inclination of his nature, a passing on or transient moment. It is linked to changes in moods, which increases as his illnesses and the stone disease progresses. But as melancholy is more often present during his illness, also because Monte knows the cause of the stone disease and the inevitable exit that had affected his father, this melancholic state begins to take hold of the philosopher more often, so much so that we no longer read in the states B and C of the text, a complete rejection of melancholy as a trait of his character, as it was still the case before 1580. So we see that there is a shift in Montaigne's conception of melancholy after 1580, so after this visit to Basel. It seems as if he is gradually accepting his melancholy. So as I said before, it is probably linked to this visit to Basel where he met Plata that he is changing his opinion. With the physician, he most probably discussed his stone disease, his melancholy, and his intestinal disorders related to both diseases and conditions. In his editions of the 1588 uh, edition to the essays, which is state C, Monte not only accepts that his melancholic state is linked to the deterioration of his health, but also that the imagination plays an important role in the disease and the lower part of the abdomen is involved in melancholy. Those the state C of the essays draws a picture of Felix Plato's typical patient who suffers from, and I now I say a word, hypochondriacal melancholy. And I will come back to it later with Plato. With the suffering and the deterioration of his health, Montaigne says that he is thinking more and more into melancholy, and he agrees that sadness is like a vicious circle that feeds on the one hand, sad thoughts, and on the other uh, hand, the state of health of the body, as Plata also defined it. Moreover, according to Montaigne, thinking about illness can aggravate the illness and those also the melancholy. 
This is the power of the imagination in melancholy, which Plata also uh, mentions. It can be so perversive that it can overthrow man, as Montaigne says. This is why he advocates a certain attention to the imagination to guide and control it. Yet imagination has such a power that it can cause bodily harm by the mere sight or sound of a sick person. Imagination can transfer an evil from another man to oneself and trigger a disease. Montaigne thus acknowledges that his imagination has a great impact on him and even gives him imaginary symptoms linked to no real cause in him. Furthermore, during the self-analysis, Montaigne wrote down all the different ailments that affected him, the causes, the symptoms and the treatments tried, so that if the same ailment affected him a second time, he could refer to his own notes to cure himself. We will see that Plata pointed out the great interest that hypochondriac melancholics had in their various ailments. This obsession went so far that some of these patients studied medicine to be able to cure themselves of all possible ailments. Montem seems to have the same characteristic as these hypochondriac melancholics. It is therefore highly probable that Montem had consulted Plata about a stone disease and that Platter had shared his idea of hypochondriacal melancholy with him, perhaps even suggesting that Montaigne himself showed some signs of this disease. But let us come to Platter and see what is his new approach to melancholy or his new idea. In uh, Praxis Medica, Platter defines melancholy as the state in which, and I quote, the imagination and judgment are so perverted that without any reason, those who suffer from it become very sad and afraid. They are unable to point to any cause of grief and fear, except ordinary events or erroneous opinions, which result from their sick apprehension of the world." End of quotation. The sadness of the melancholic is those caused by an invasive imagination, which produces images without any concrete cause that disturb the rational judgment of situations. In melancholy, it is the images produced by the imagination that make one sad, not the situation themselves, which are understood in an altered way. This dysfunction in the mind is linked, according to Platter, to a dysfunction of the humors and therefore of the body, a theory already present in Hippocrates and Galen. According to Hippocrates, a man who, who dwells too long on thoughts of sadness and fear triggers the production of black bill. And the theory of humors, one distinguished for four principal uh, uh, humors, blood, phlegm, yellow bill, and black bill. If these four humors are in an equal proportion in man, then he is healthy. On the other hand, if there is, is disorder or dyscrasia, then man is ill. This explanation comes from the fact that the human body is considered to be, to be made up of the four natural elements, earth, water, air, fire, which are not always harmonized. And I quote from a French book on medicine in the 16th uh, century or in uh, Renaissance and the 16th century, the, the theory of the four cardinal humors correspond to the association of different elements. I mean the quotation. So blood is hot, uh, hot and humid as fire and water. Pituitary or phlegm is cold and humid like air and water. Bill or anger is hot and dry like fire and earth. And melancholy or black bill is cold and dry like air and earth. End of quotation. Since the body is understood to be composed of these four natural elements, it is understandable that each mood is also related to the external weather conditions, so that a mood is more present according to some season, for example. So the therapy or healing is also conditioned by the season, the weather conditions. For example, bloodletting was done in spring because the characteristics of this season most closely resemble the characteristics of the blood that is warm and humid or temperate. As we can see, body and soul in this theory of humors are strongly linked and affect each other and thoughts of sadness or fear, therefore, can stimulate the spleen, which is in the body, and then, and then the production of the black bill. And conversely, the production of black bill can trigger sad thoughts. So there's a vice versa reciprocal um, stimulation. 
Those even man sings for a long time into sad thoughts, he stimulates with great impact and continuously the production of black bill, which then overflows the spleen and invades the whole body. The mooch which breathes through the body like a cloud of humoral vapor, consequently obsesses the mind and may cause it to think further into melancholy. From a simple state of sadness, man then passes to melancholy even worse to depression, because the imagination perverted by the mood continually shows him images of sadness or fear, those are turning the perception of the world, but without being able to detect the real cause of the sadness. However, Felix Platter does not stay at this stage of melancholy. This is like coming from the theories of Hippocrates and melancholy. I said, he is more interested uh, in what he will call the hypochondriacal melancholy, which is a, spe a very special form of melancholy. Galen already distinguished between three kinds of melancholy. The first was a vice of the brain by Galen. The second came from the blood or black bill and the third from the lower abdomen and spleen. It is exactly this third category of melancholy, which will be called hypochondriacal melancholy. Galen, however, referred to it simply as hypochondriasis, a term that today refers to the fear of suffering from a serious illness, even after negative medical checkups. And Galen included in this disease the sufferings of the soul, such as sadness and fear, which are moreover the same causes as for melancholy, which then trigger the same symptoms as for melancholy, to which are added flatulence and digestive disorders. It is interesting to notice that some doctors and medical thinkers of the early modern period and the beginnings of the pathological anatomy included in the list of physical symptoms of hypochondriacal melancholy, headaches, and a special type of fever, as well as tamely. Furthermore, precordial feelings of heat, pressure, pain, flatulence, digestive complaints were signs of a hypochondriacal melancholy. So we see that here uh, Gallen is taken up again, but uh, Platter is going even further. But first of all, this uh, idea of fever, this fever or sensation of heat were explained as coming from an excessively heated black bill or yellow bill or even blood. This shows us that the explanation of melancholy in the 16th century did not only follow the theory of humor disorders as we have seen before. And Professor Stolberg writes, I quote him, like most other diseases, however, melancholy in the 16th century was generally attributed not to an imbalance of the humors, but ascribed to a particular morbid matter, in this case, black, or more specifically, black and burnt matter. It could develop when natural black bill was excessively heated and vapors arose from it, but also from yellow bill and even blood when they were burned in the body. End of quotation. So it seems clear that a certain type of fever is triggered by a burn matter in the body, and those fever is directly related to melancholy, even if only in hypochondriacal melancholy. So, and Felix Platter understands hypochondriacal melancholy in the same way as Galen, although he no longer accepts to speak simply of hypochondria, but of hypochondriacal melancholy, and adds to these symptoms a strong alteration of the imagination and those mental disorders which affect everyday life. His interest in pathological anatomy made him change the term of this disease to hypochondriacal melancholy, because for Platter, hypochondria is not a disease in itself, like for Gallen. It can only be associated with another main disease as a second cause or as a symptom, because the hypochondrium is conceived in pathological anatomy as the anatomical seat of pain. And here we have a um, definition, again from the book from Professor Stolberg, the term hypochondria referred to the area in the body where the disease was believed to originate, that is the upper abdomen. The term is composed of the Greek words for under, hippo, and cartilage, chondros, referring to the costal cartilage. The established explanation of the disease, hypochondria, was that pathogenic vapors rose from the abdomen to the heart, lungs, and brain. 
they compromise the function of those organs and lead to associated symptoms. Sometimes, physicians also use the expression melancholia miracalis, which was derived from the Arabic words for abdomen or upper abdomen. End of quotation. The most interesting thing about all this is that physicians do not agree on the exact location of melancholy and the various symptoms. Some, as I have already said, some speak of the spleen as the primary organ producing the black bill, and in the Renaissance, the dominions of the black bill was the cause of some cases of melancholy. Some others, primarily in the 16th century, however, speak of the heated liver as the inner cause of the melancholic humor because the heated liver burned the blood. And I have uh, made them in red here on these uh, images of the uh, of the abdomen, so to say, so to to demonstrate where they are situated in our body. Some others again speak of the upper abdomen and the costil, uh, cartilage for the area for hypochondriacal melancholy. And then finally, we see Plata, who is rever uh, referring to the mesentery for this hypochondriacal melancholy. So there is a little shift between the, the location. What is certain is that all accept the location in the upper abdomen and believe that it is a heating and burning of matter or blood or humoral fluid which causes melancholy. Felix Flutter is nonetheless the one of the doctors who dealt most with the various symptoms of melancholy and tried to understand their origin and cause. According to him, in hypochondriacal melancholy, a large part of the symptoms is only imagined and results from a dysfunction of the sense functions. Those hypochondriacal melancholy differs from melancholy in that it, it does not simply affect the mind, which can then have negative repercussions on the body, as in the case of sad thoughts, admittedly imagined, which trigger a feeling of sickness in the heart, but above all it affects the imagination, which causes imaginary symptoms to be added to the already existing symptoms and leads the person into a vicious circle that links sad and negative thoughts while causing bodily disorders. For this very reason, hypochondriacal melancholy is always referred to as an illness, which is not the case with melancholy, which can be a temporary state, a mood or character trait. In the Observationum, Felix Platter defines hypochondriacal melancholy. He says, patients suffering from this illness are convinced that they are affected by a large number of different illnesses because of the large number of different symptoms and because of their overactive imagination. However, even though Platter talks about mental disorders, he avoids talking about them as a simple form of madness. According to him, these mental disorders are related to the body and in particular to a dysfunction in the belly, which has an impact of the, of the functions of the senses. Platter's originality lies in the combination of the medical theories of his time with the heritage of Galen and Hippocrates. For the Basel physician, hypochondriacal melancholy is a mixture of melancholy, overactive imagination that alters reality, and disorders originating in the mesentery. This last observation, which gained ground during the 60s and 70s centuries, breaks with the Galini conception that saw obstruction of the stomach as the primary cause of this form of melancholy. Plata, on the other hand, opts for the mesentery because th this organ is directly linked to all the other organs that may be affected in hypochondriacal melancholy. This idea of a new location of the center of this form of melancholy was adopted in the intellectual milieu of Western physicians from the 17th century onwards, and an explanation strongly resembling Platters can be found in Balonius or Guillaume de Bayou, who wrote his medical works at the same time as Platter. This French physician agrees with Platter that the main seat of this melancholy is no longer the stomach, but rather the spleen and with it the mesentery, which then disturbed the digestive system. As we can see on this image, the splenic vein and the two mesenteric veins are coming together at the level of the hepatic portal vein. 
So an overproduction of black bile invades the splenic vein and can then easily be invading also the mesenteric veins, which transport this burnt humoral fluid to all the other organs involved in the digestive system, where it causes trouble. We understand that the mental symptoms, the delirium, which Platter refused to count among the signs of madness, are triggered as a result of the intestinal disorders. According to Platter and many of his contemporaries, doctors and anatomists, hypochondriacal melancholy differs from melancholy in its gradual course. Sort of sadness or fear that occupy a person's mind for a long time trigger the abundant production of black bile in the spleen. If these thoughts persist, the black bile becomes so abundant that it overflows the organ and spreads throughout the body as an invasive mood and disturbs the proper function of the mesentery causing intestinal disorders. This mood then spreads as a cloud or vapor through the body until it reaches the brain, where it causes disturbances of the mind. Its primary cause is due to a defect of the spleen and the accumulation of blood of improper heat quality in the mesenteric vessels, which then leads secondarily to indigestion in the stomach and intestines and produces the black bile fumes, which driven up to the brain by their own heat, produce the mental symptoms there. So the imagination on the one hand fed by sad thoughts, on the other hand disturbed by the vapor of the black bill and by the disturbances in the intestine, produced these exaggerated and exaggerating images which alter reality, which sadden without real reason and which amplify the real symptoms. A man once suffering from hypochondriacal melancholy finds himself in a vicious circle where the disease itself creates images providing sad thoughts, which are the very trigger of melancholy. This is why this form of melancholy is called an illness, because it is not a temporary condition and it's difficult to cure. The most dangerous aspect of this illness is the impairment of the imagination which makes men see themselves differently in the illness. Melancholy, like the hypochondriacal one, makes men understand themselves as modified. They think that their body is made of glass or clay and therefore can break, or that it is made of butter and therefore can melt. They think of themselves without a head or with an empty body like a jug. You have this, for example, also in Descartes' first meditation. But understanding one's body as an empty body or glass body is referred to as Cotard's syndrome in 1880, a syndrome that damages the body and the perception of the body due to melancholic depression. There are also those who believe they are of a different social status, rich or poor, a king or even divine. Seeing oneself as a king when one is poor or seeing oneself closed when one is naked probably comes more from a derangement of the mind than from simple melancholy and is therefore strongly linked to excessive imagination as found in hypochondriacal melancholy. In the Observationum, Plata tells of various cases he had treated in which imagination plays the main role. For symptoms in the intestine, for example, the patients imagine particular causes, such as having a frog in their belly or carrying abominable rubbish. What is most remarkable in the description of the various cases of delusions and even hypochondriacal melancholy is that all the patients were intelligent or educated. The overactive imagination is thus not the consequence of an idle or even naive mind, but occurs most often in people of lively nature. Moreover, some of Plata's patients had themselves made medical studies of their own symptoms and were therefore convinced that, they, that every little bodily change must involve something serious and negative. Montan could well have been one of Plata's patients. It helps him of his penchant for melancholy and of his stomach problems linked to the stone disease. Plata, in giving him a medical checkup, then tells him about his idea of hypochondriacal melancholy and its signs and symptoms, which would explain why we read of a change in Montaigne's conception of melancholy. This hypo hypothesis is confirmed when we read that Montaigne accepts as a seed of the disturbance of the humors next to the stomach, also the lower part of the belly, which was the leading idea of Felix Plata. And here we have the quotation. We see very well that the finger moves, that the food moves, that some parts as, uh, assume a voluntary motion of themselves without our consent, 
and that others work by our direction, that one is one sort of apprehension occasions blushing, another paleness. Such an imagination works upon the spleen only, another upon the brain. One occasions laughter, another tears. Another stupefies and astonishes all our senses and arrests the motion of all our members. At one object, the stomach will rise, at the other, a member that lies something lower. End of quotation. This last sentence that Montaigne adds uh, in the 1588 edition is evidence of an exchange with Plata on hypochondriacal melancholy. The stomach or the spleen were long considered the main seed of bodily disturbance caused by sad thoughts or melancholy. It was thought that the stomach or the spleen were blocked by black bile and that the vapors of it arose and invaded the whole body. However, Plata had pointed out that it was rather the mesentery, what Montaigne calls here a lower part of the abdomen. Moreover, we see confirmed that Montaigne was very familiar with the theory of humors and probably also with the medical discussions of his time. Since the spleen is the seed of the black bill production, Montaigne understood that imagination had a great impact on the production of humors in the spleen and those on melancholy, and vice versa. So let us now come uh, to Descartes and his ideas on fever and melancholy. Um, to see if this change from the spleen to the mesentery, or from the stomach to the mesentery, was adopted in French philosophy in the 17th century. Descartes came from a medical family. His two grandfathers were both physicians, and it is quite possible that Descartes studied medicine at Poitiers after he had finished at La Fleche. Since Descartes studied anatomy and the body at a very early age, he was often asked for his medical advice by his correspondents. Marine Mercine, for example, wrote in a letter to Descartes that he was suffering from a skin disease. With Mercine, Descartes also discussed the situation of Claude Clercelier, who suffered from epileptic fits. Others, like Blaise Pascal, had some advice from Descartes concerning his weak condition. It is therefore not surprising to see that Elizabeth of Bohemia, a princess, described her suffering to Descartes in a letter. On the 18th of May 1645, Descartes inquired about the state of health of the princess after Monsieur Polo had informed him that the princess was ill for a long time. He wrote to the princess, and here's the quotation and the picture of the princess. I learned from his last letters that your highness has had a low-grade fever accompanied by a dry cough, which lasted three or four weeks, and that after you had recovered from this for five or six days, the illness returned. However, at the time that he sent me his letter, which was almost 15 days en route, your highness was beginning to get better once again. In regard to all this, I know the signs of a quite considerable illness, but nevertheless, one from which it seems that your highness can so certainly recover that I cannot abstain from writing her my feelings on the matter. From this letter, we learn that the princess suffered from a low-grade fever and a dry cough from which Elizabeth could only recover with difficulty. This is why she did not, as usually, quickly respond to Descartes' letter. Furthermore, as the princess had already consulted the philosopher for another ailment, he decided to share his opinion. As he is writing, I cannot abstain from writing to my feelings. To share his opinion on fever in his letters, and so he, he says what he is thinking there is the cause of uh, the fever in Elizabeth. And here's the quotation. The most common cause of a low-grade fever is sadness, and the stubbornness of fortune in persecuting your house continually gives you matters for annoyance. What can Dikan mean when he seeks the cause of the fever in sadness? Does he think that a melancholic state can cause fever, which we have seen before, and which is the link to dry cough? It is interesting that it is uh, Elizabeth in a letter from the 24th of May 1645 that she is the, the first one who gives an, an explanation for her sadness. And here is it. Know those that I have a body imbued with a large part of the weaknesses of my sex so that it is affected very easily by the afflictions of the soul and has none of the strength to bring itself back into line as it is of a temperament subject to obstructions and resisting in an air which contributes strongly to this. In people who cannot exercise much, it does not take a long oppression of the heart by sadness to obstruct the spleen and infect the rest of the body by its vapors. 
I myself imagine that the low fever and the dry thought, which have not yet left me, even with the warmth of the season, and though the walks I take bring back my strength a little, come from this, end of quotation. So Elizabeth is convinced that her bodily sickness is related to her mental state. Body and soul play a major role in our health, as she always underlined it in her letters to Descartes. This is also a reason why she tends to turn to Descartes with her health problems, because her doctors only see the physical symptoms and do not draw conclusions about her mental state like the philosopher. Furthermore, she also thinks that her weak body is not equipped to defend itself against negative influences on her psyche. So for the princess, there is a reciprocal effect in illness, from the body to the soul and from the soul to the body. This is also clear in the following sentence. In people uh, who cannot exercise much, it does not take a long oppression of the heart by sadness to obstruct the spleen and infect the rest of the body by its vapors. It's taken from the same letter of uh, the 24th of May. So Elizabeth believes that physical activity has a positive effect on the body and therefore indire in indirectly on the state of mind. Physical exercise helps to remove the obstruction of the spleen that could be caused by sadness. Bodily movement makes the heart beat faster and the general opinion was that by processing blood quickly, no build up can occur and there is no obstruction of the spleen. When the spleen is not obstructed with bad blood, then there will be no weapons invading the rest of the body, going up to the mind and causing negative thoughts. So to break out of the circle of melancholy, the circle which I called before, sad, uh, sad thoughts cause an oppression of the heart and an obstruction of the spleen, which could then cause negative thoughts and due to weapons arose from the spleen and, and so on. So to break out of this circle, one must avoid or get rid of the obstruction of the spleen which is the bodily uh, uh, location, so that it does not feed sadness even further by enabling negative thoughts to its vapors. And Elizabeth goes even further. The obstruction of the spleen and the vapors are the direct cause of the fever and the dry thought. Warm vapors dry out the respiratory tract and those cause coffee. They also heat up the body excessively so that one feels fever. For her, the obstruction of the spleen is linked to melancholy, as you notice in her letter to Degard on the 22nd of June 1645. And here is the quotation. Your letters, when they do not teach me, always serve me as the antidote to melancholy, turning my mind from the disag disagreeable objects that come to it every day to the happiness that I possess in the friendship of a person of your merit, to whose counsel I can commit the con conduct of my life." End of quotation. Melancholy or sadness are those the primary cause of the bodily sickness, and therefore for Elizabeth it is clear that she can not only heal her body, but even has to take care of her soul. And I quote her again, I fear that if I do not use my mind at all while I am taking waters of spa in Belgium, it will only become more melancholy. If I were able to profit as you do from everything that prevent, presents itself to my senses, I would divert myself without difficulty. End of quotation. At the time, drinking or bathing in the waters of spa was a common remedy against obstruction, and also against melancholy, as one considers melancholy coming from the non-stoption of the spleen. But for the princess, treating one's illness only with a remedy that acts on the body cannot be sufficient, even if this remedy acts directly on the bodily cause of the illness. The mind has to be distracted too. On November 1646, Descartes wrote his opinion on the waters of Spa, and here is the quotation. The acid and the iron in the waters of spa give much less reason to fear, and since they both shrink the spleen and chase away melancholy, I value these waters, end of quotation. For Descartes, acid and iron help to shrink the spleen, whose size is depending on the amount of black bill in it. During melancholy, black bill is abundant in the spleen, so the later expands and becomes larger, and yet some of the black bill will spill over and touch other organs. We see that Descartes, but also Elizabeth, are still strongly oriented towards the theory of the humors defended by Galen and Hippocrates, and they both take the spleen as the main seat for melancholy. Did Descartes 
have no knowledge of Plato's theory, which was also taken up by some French anatomists and physicians, and which replaced the spleen with the mesentery. It seems that Plato's idea was too new so that it had not yet spread among the physicians when Descartes became interested in anatomy. In his Exerte Anatomica, uh, in Descartes' Exerte Anatomica, he speaks only of the mesentric vein, but not of the organ mesentery. And in his letter to Elizabeth on May 6046, where he listed all the principles of his physics, he speaks of the spleen and the liver, but not of the mesentery. And here's the quotation. The duty of the liver and the spleen is always to, is always to contain some reserve blood, less purified than what is in the veins, and that the fire in the heart needs to be continually fired, either by the juice of meats, which comes directly from the stomach, or without that by the blood that is in the reserve, since the other blood, which is in the veins, expands too easily." End of quotation. This explains very well why the blood from the spleen could be the cause of fever. When this reserve blood from the spleen is abundant or more vicious because burnt, uh, then it fires up the fire in the heart so much that overheating, that is fever, occurs. Dika does not really need resorting to the mesentery as the function of the spleen explains both illnesses, so fever and melancholy. Furthermore, Dika and, uh, and Elizabeth discuss the normal state of melancholy and not the hypochondriacal melancholy as Plata did. This is probably why they refer to the spleen and not to the mesentery. Thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.